I'm, I'll introduce myself. So I'm uh, Dr. Manreet Nidra. I was a practicing uh, infectious diseases and general medical physician in the UK up till about two months ago uh, with an interest in HIV and TB. I'm co-founder of a company called True. Um, I'm also uh, a Sovereign Foundation founding steward um, and I work as the NHS England Clinical Entrepreneur. I've got a fellowship for driving innova innovation. <clears throat> and I also have a policy role with the British government on their all-party parliamentary group on blockchain and healthcare, advising policy moving forward on implementation by the UK government. So why is a doctor talking at a Hyperledger conference? Well, I, I don't know if you've all read this, uh, the introduction to Hyperledger paper. Uh, the, 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 what was it? The, the uh, compelling use cases was actually my use case, um, and we use Hyperledger Indy. So all that was taken from the work I started. So how did it start? Well, one of the things I was going to do is, is a survey of the room. I mean, when we talk about trust and everyone talks about identity and trust, my role as a doctor, as you can see, an uh, independent poll, I'm very trusted. But what, I, what I, I tend to find is a lot of this stuff is driven by business leaders who are down at the 25%. So we talk about adoption and implementation. Who, who's going to do it, right? Who do people trust? And it's about relationships, ultimately. Um, so one of the things... I get to do in my role as a doctor is I have the privilege of building trusted relationships very quickly um, because people, people, patients trust me. It's very intimate. I examine people. I try and help them in their, their greatest need. Um, and over the last 12 years, I've been in situations where, uh, horrible situations where I'm trying to resuscitate a 19-year-old when the whole family's there. These are hard things. And from that, I've learned about doing things the right way um, and not always being driven by money and commercial things, but that is important. And I, I'm a strong believer if you do things the right way, we can, we can leverage this technology uh, for the greater good. So when I was working four years ago in a hospital in the UK, um, the UK has a shortage of doctors. Um, and they depend on things called locum agencies, so temporary staffing. And I was working four night shifts, and I was working with a temporary doctor who basically, I don't think was qualified enough to do the job he was doing. He was putting patients at risk, dragging me away from the 400 patients I was going to be looking after, um, and getting paid five times more than me. So that 480 million a year, that's come down from two billion. So, but it's people who are gaming the system. And then alongside that, this is all within the last three months in the UK, there are people practicing in the UK who are fraudulent. Um, and that actually just puts patients at risk. Um, in a position where you, you've got trust, I think you need to understand that your family, whether, you're, whether it's a, ter a temporary or permanent doctor, you should have the knowledge that that doctor is there to do a job that they can do and someone can claim that they can do it as opposed to just turning up just because of the pressures. So that's where I wanted to come from. So I was going to try and solve this problem four years ago. Um, and that was the local, that was my personal problem. Um, this is the national problem. So it's recognized in the UK. This was the Lord Holmes report, which was published just over a year ago on distributed ledgers and how we can use it for public good. Um, 25,000 doctor days a year is spent on ident manual identity checking in the UK. Um, and that's only for 50,000 doctors. So there's another 230,000 doctors. These doctors were picked out because they rotate every three, four, six months yearly. And hospital A won't trust hospital B, which is five miles down the road. Um, and so if that's 25,000 doctors and they see eight patients a day, that's, you, you can start doing the maths, it starts building up, that's 200,000 pati patients a year. If that's a delayed discharge, that's cost, length of stay. If you haven't made an intervention when you're meant to, you can just, the maths kind of does its, itself. Um, but we're not just about doctors, we're also, we're one sixtieth of the UK population is employed and we're the third or the fifth biggest employer in the world. Um, but on a global level, 
we know the WHO knows that we're going to have almost a 13 million shortage of skilled healthcare workers uh, by 2035. Um, there's a big movement of certain governments bringing in trained skilled healthcare workers into the developed areas without compensating these countries where the need is greater. Um, so one of my thoughts was so by solving this problem, I want to try and bring in some sort of healthcare equality and whether we create a global trusted healthcare network where we can start using new models of care. So I went and signed up to one of these agencies, uh, literally took my passport, took my university degree, took my license, the lady scanned it, and I was ready to go. And I was like, that's not right. That's literally, I can go work in any hospital in the UK, um, and they will make money. And they were taking about 15 to 40% commission was what was offered to me. I never did a shift, but that was, that's the rates they were doing. So I was thinking, well, if we could digitize the identity process, then we could solve the problem. There was no need for them because the agencies were taking the risk of doing the identity and compliance checks. So when I looked into the whole identity space, I, four years ago, like a good physician, always want to solve the problem. I looked at all the models, so centralized identity models, federated identity models, user-centric. And a decentralized identity model was basically what I thought could meet all the needs that I do as an end user and what I need as a, as a physician to practice. Um, what we have is we have multiple identity silos as doctors. So we have multiple clinical, clinical systems identity. So I could say one identity is a hospital, one's my licensing authority, one's my medical school, one is my occupational health, that's somewhere else, that's the next hospital I go to. And they don't share, they don't share the information. And I, as the end user, have to go through this experience. Whereas all I want to do as a doctor is I just want to look after and, and treat people. So these are all my credentials. So that's my passport. Um, that's my Royal College of Physicians degree. There's another one saying I'm a specialist in infectious diseases. I've got a criminal records check there. I've got my license. I've got a couple of proof of addresses. Um, and there's my medical school degree as well. And an occupational health thing, which I'd lost. So I needed to get my blood test again to be honest, and that's a frequent thing. And then there's costs associated with that because the hospital has to take blood tests, they have to run it to the lab. So there's all these hidden costs. And actually, I don't really want to be jabbed. I know I'm a doctor, but I don't really want to be jabbed with another needle to, to take blood. So I was thinking, how can we get from this model where we have these separated identity silos into this distributed identity layer? And that's how I came upon sovereign and thought, actually, why don't I be the user and why can't I be in control of all my credentials? So we went um, and we've developed this wallet with uh, Evanim and Sovereign. So this is just a, I can, I can demo it later to anyone if they want. I've got the wallet on my phone. So the idea would be there's this physical to digital interface. We're using the post office because they're trusted identity providers in the UK. They use their biometric scanners. They take a photo and they issue a credential like they already do because they do the passport sends and check away in the UK manually at the moment. So they act as the trust anchor. So I hold that credential and they give it to me. So when I want to start university, instead of having to go and do an identity check at university, I could go onto a website take a picture of the QR code, we then develop a relationship, they still don't know who I am, and then they can ask for the credentials of my proof of ID, which I can consent and send across. So GDPR-wise, that's quite good because there's a consent mechanism, I'm holding my data, it's portable. There's data minimization on their side because they just, all they need to do is record it and it's audible and trackable. And they see it and they can go, oh, they'll do the lookup on the ledger, they'll see the public key, they'll be like, oh yes, it's." It's been done by the post office, and that's the only public key associated with the post office. And so what then happens is you just build that up. You then complete your degree, and then you get a credential with your university degree. Like you get your physical degree, you'll also get issued a digital credential, a verifiable credential with your degree, which you hold. And you just start building this up along your career. So you go from this um, to 
to this. So I have my passport, my driving license, and my proof of address. I've got my General Medical Council license to practice credential. I've, got, I've worked at Blackpool Hospital and what role I've got. Um, and it shows exactly what I can do, what skills I can do. So I can actually, can I do a chest strain on someone or can I not? That can be signed off. I have my university degree. Um, and I've, I've got a connection with the next hospital I'm going to go work on. And so how we work is, we've heard about Sovereign today, so we used Hyperledger Indy, we did sov we used Sovereign, and the reason we chose Sovereign was because medical professionals are very highly regulated and very trusted, and there's a lot of governance around us. So we thought we need some element of technology where we need to use governance. Now, one of the things I've learned in the last four years in the tech space and people talking about blockchain and decentralization being the trust, it's still humans are interacting with it. So there's, we need some sort of govern, governance mechanism around this specific use case. Um, and then we worked with Evanim who, prov who helped provide the um, enterprise agents and, and the wallet. And then us as True, we uh, develop a domain specific uh, governance framework. So all the actors in, in the ecosystem understand their role and where the liability models act. Um, we are intending to be open source, open standards, so we're not specific to Indy or Sovereign. Anyone can plug in and plug out if they can meet the governance standards that we give to them. And um, that's what we're trying to drive at, at UK level and within the NHS um, ourselves. So we now have this, and where are we to date? Where are we to date? So we've completed a proof of con concept with the National Health Service in the UK with a minimal viable product, as shown. Um, so that was demonstrated a couple of weeks ago. This has been sponsored by the Chief Clinical Information Officer at NHS England, so it's right at director level. It's on their, it's on their strategy. They need a consistent staff identifier. They have issues with that. They're looking at federated models of identity, which they're having difficulties implementing. We've got a UK pilot planned next year, which is going to use 100 real doctors. Um, we've got a national physical identity checking provider, such as the post office. We've enrolled a university medical school, a healthcare board, a hospital, our, our licensing authority. And actually, we have got a clinical systems provider because actually you could just get a credential issued to access the clinical system. So where that becomes a patient safety issue is if my license gets revoked, my clinical access gets revoked. Um, so then I can't log in to prescribe something if some does a look up and it gets changed. So we're working with one of them. Um, we've also just created a domain-specific governance framework and a governance board, um, which will be holding its first meeting in the new year. Um, we've got all stakeholders engaged, so people for NHS Digital Identity, uh, Professor of Digital Health at the Royal College of Physicians. We've got world-leading technologists as well, um, and lawyers as well. As I said, we're the first sovereign um, steward. We got that a couple of months ago, um, which was great news. Um, and we've, I've just come back from Bangladesh. So we just we, we were in Bangladesh uh, last week or week before. Um, and it was four hours north of Dhaka, where it's this really poor village um, where they train up the local poor to look after the poor. And they credential them. And so we were. They have a need because they can't access resources. So we've, we've um, basically mapped out giving them credentials. And so in the new year, what we're going to do is we're going to do a credential exchange. So as a doctor in the UK, they can check my credentials. And I can, I can check that their credential once we put the, the um, tech implementation in. Because everyone there has got a smartphone. They haven't got sanitation, but it's surprising. Everyone's actually got a smartphone. They can check my credentials, and we can check their credentials, and then we could just do a telehealth link. And so that's, that's to prove that actually this is, this is actually a global healthcare network. So I want to try and bring some sort of healthcare equality so we can kind of meet the WHO's kind of... So if you get trained in Bangladesh, but you want to move to the UK for a better life, that's fine. But wouldn't it be nice if you could give back to the country of your training. So that's, that's personal to me because I was born in Kenya. My grandparents come from India. Um, and that's why I chose to do this, this healthcare. And, it, and, and so from an infectious diseases point of view, I kind of hope the technology and my own personal interests converge in doing this. Um, that's my 10 minutes, I think, or 20 minutes. Um, that's what we're doing. Um, 
I'm happy to do a demo. I've got a demo, so I'm happy to show anyone over the next two, three days. I can show you the live demo. Um, I'm happy to be contacted on Twitter or on, on email. Um, I'm around till Saturday morning. Um, thank you very much.